you down a path. Um, clearly, today is about entrepreneurship and the leaders of Asian leaders and learning about entrepreneurship and obviously your experiences, Derek. And so, I think theme of past, present, future. I think that's where I'd like to go. And the first thing is, well, what was your first entrepreneurial venture? And don't say hyperfactory. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, uh, what led you to? Let me finish. Yeah. Sorry. What led you to that idea? And what made it a success for you? In your mind, it was what was it that made it a success? Okay. Uh, as May said, I was born in Hong Kong. Uh, my wife is, uh, my mother is um, uh, part Chinese, part Malay, part Indian. And we moved here when I was um, uh, fourth form, third or fourth form. And my dad is an entrepreneur. He started business in Hong Kong. And so we were always surrounded by the idea that starting businesses is okay and it's normal. My grandfather was also an entrepreneur. Very small, like, you know, two or three people kind of companies. So it's quite normal in our family. Uh, when I got here, um, one of the things I liked to do at that age was play uh, video games. And I couldn't get enough of the types of video games I'd like to play. They weren't available. Uh, they were um, really old. I mean, this is, you know, the 90s. It took like a year to get anything that was new. And so I started a, a, what became a business by trying to get uh, consoles and games from Asia, import them and sell them using the trade and exchange, which at that time was a newspaper. So I did it because I wanted the games, but then after I'd finished with them, I'd sell, and it worked so well that I started to actually just do it as a thing, and you know, within a year I had like good income, good salary, I, I was that. at school, <laughs> and a cell phone, and I was like, this is a pretty cool gig, maybe I should continue exploring, you know, how do you create businesses? And um, that's really the first, the first seed of it. So it's in your blood? I mean, yes and no, because oh, I guess so. All three of, my, uh, the three of us as brothers uh, built the Hype Factory together. Mm. So, you know, we're entrepreneurs in essence. Um, but even if it's in your blood, I think you still have to decide that's what you want to do. Because I went to university and I decided I want to be an architect. So I started studying architecture and design and... Um, for a while there, I was going to become an architect, you know. So even though I thought I could do some things in business, I thought maybe I'll have a career doing something else. Okay. The start of a long career, long path of successful companies. Well, you... Also a lot of literally, you know, littered with failed companies too. We'll, we'll get to that. Right. Well, I'll get to no, that. Um, yeah. So in your book, um, you had a series of electric highs and crushing lows. Quote, any successful business person learns from their lows what would you say were your lowest lows in business and what were your key learnings that entrepreneurs in the room today can learn from? Uh, so they generally came hand in hand, to be honest. Um, the, the learning generally came from failure and lows. You know, the, the things you learned when things went wrong were far more exceptionally profound than the things you were learning as things go right. So it's good that you've kind of linked them together because I fundamentally believe that they are the, the most important things are when things go terribly wrong um, and you take the time to look back at it, it's when you uncover the most insight about yourself or about a situation uh, or about a market or whatever it might be. So Lowe's, you know, when you're starting any business or trying to build it, the main, one of the main challenges is cash flow. So it becomes quite uh, gut-wrenching to worry about cash balances and when you are hiring people, um, it becomes even more gut-wrenching because it's not just you. If it's just you and a couple of people you know and your friends, uh, you can figure it out. You, know, you can eat ramen, you can do these things, whatever it takes. But when you have a payroll to meet, it's quite stressful. So learning how to forecast and manage cash is um, uh, probably you know, one, of the, one of the most, uh, I guess, difficult things uh, that, that entrepreneurs need to learn. Um, but the, the most crushing low was when, you know, at times companies die or they fail. And for me, the, the, definitely the change, you know, the tipping point in my life as to how I saw the world was when the hyper factory was uh, about to go under during the middle of the recession. So December, Jan uh, period and uh, of the recession of 2008, 2009. At that point, realizing that maybe by March or April the business would be go gone under, it made me really rethink what the purpose of business is. And that's where I kind of expanded my um, you know, thought process around how can business be used to become a driver for you know, social good and environmental good and if you're going to be in business you might as well be trying to solve real problems. Um, 
But we got through that period, and we got through lots of periods that were ups and downs, and the main lesson I have from that is that we had a very strong vision of what we were trying to do, and that vision is what pulled all the staff and everyone that was in that organization through, and the vision was pretty simple. One day, this handset would be the remote control to our lives. Every media company, every brand, and every consumer would need to be connected through it, and we would be the organization that would help them do that. So having that vision uh, and being very crystal clear about it and repeating it constantly um, was what became, you know, the, the, the jewel of success from, from all the different ups and downs. Yeah, okay. Um, the Hyperfactory and Schneck Media, they play, play in the digital media space. You have clearly been through, been a thought leader in this space. In your mind, how do you see the digital media going in light of the current insatiable demand for content by consumers? Uh, where, where do I think it's heading? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, well, I think it's um, business life cycles have been shortened. You know, opportunities are huge, bigger than they've ever been to create a business that affects hundreds of millions of people or billion people within a year or two, which is, you know, the likes of WhatsApp is an example of that. So the space is now something that is, it's basically democratized, you know, building global companies. And it's also crushed the time period to months you know, years, but probably even sooner it's going to be months. So I see that it will continue to compress time periods as we're more digitally connected. If an idea is good or if a service is good, then it should be able to travel the world faster and faster and faster, which is scary, but it's also the reality of things. But equally, if someone comes out with something better, then incumbents are at great risk. So someone like Facebook is at great risk constantly, more than, say, a General Motors would have been 50 years ago with a similar market cap. It would take a lot more to dismantle General Motors and beat them at their own game than it would today to unseat Facebook uh, or Twitter or even Google. So as fast as you can create these companies, they equally uh, are now in, in paranoia you know, over, overdrive because they could be taken over, which is why you see someone like Facebook buying WhatsApp and buying um, Instagram. They fear that they will outpace them and replace them. And so the one thing that Zuckerberg's been amazing at is seeing which ones are the biggest threats and picking them out and paying extraordinary sums of money for them. Uh, second thing is, I think, in um, technology, we're now moving to a space where if everything's in the cloud and everyone is connected, at least in the developed world, and that's about to shift to the developing world, so getting 3G into the developing world and getting people smartphones, um, the, the global community will start to be truly, truly connected because we still have several billion people that aren't connected. Uh, so I think there's huge opportunities in space, in particularly Asian, uh, African, uh, South American regions, which aren't yet where we are. So there's enormous business uh, opportunities over there. But beyond the horizon, it's about things that are interacting with the real world. So we've seen the smartwatch or the, uh, the watch from Apple, which is a you know, wearable device which will start to connect with things that are around you and your body. Um, what's known as the Internet of Things, which is basically a science fiction thing that's been talked about for decades, but everything you interact with being smart, whether it's your fridge or your car, uh, those things are now starting to be real, um, and they are starting to become on the horizon. So they are probably, you know, when we started the Hyperfactor in 2001, mobile wasn't real, it was a vision, it's now real. We're probably at that point now for things like the Internet of Things, um, which m means in 10 years the entire... Uh, environment that we operate in is connected to the internet and to us, and what that you know what that could mean or what that could be, just you know your imagination you know could go wild. Just taking on a theme that you've said around over time, the speed from idea through to inception has really shrunk, and it's about going quickly and globally, because those companies you mentioned are exactly the one that the time to complete is shortened. For New Zealand entrepreneurs at the bottom end of the world. What would be the piece of advice if they've got that smart idea in terms of going global and the mentality around Well, that? it's different because if you'd asked me that five years ago, I was building a hybrid of a services and technology company, so I needed to go and build offices and sell things to people, human beings that would buy them, you know, big brands. So my advice then was move. You need to move. Someone needs to move there. A founder needs to go there. You can't just circuit around the world and try and pick up the business and do it from here. Um, or you need to be... Uh, investing in a presence there. So if that's the kind of business you're building, you need to do that. And I think that's a lifestyle choice that many New Zealanders are not willing to make. They're not willing to have those sacrifices to create the startup in those markets. You might have the startup here, but you want to go to a particular market, you need to do it again. You need to create it there, build the culture and everything. But now if you're talking about different types of businesses, like a, you know, let's say we're talking about a WhatsApp or a 
something that just blows up without having to have a sales force. It means that those opportunities are equally available to us as they are to every other person in the world, right? So whether they're in Croatia or San Francisco or uh, Wellington. Um, those types of businesses or opportunities, uh, they're now totally democratized in terms of geography, but they're also extremely hard. Yeah. You know, they are one in a million um, type shot. Mm -hmm. So it's a hybrid, it's a hybrid. Of, of, of situations. Yeah, I thought that's where you were going to hit. I'm going to take it slightly differently now. Recently, you promoted businesses and business people should not just make money, but also help tackle the social issues of society through their business. What do you see are the key pillars to delivering on such goals? So going back to this comment about the recession, the reason I kind of ended up here was during the recession, trying to get at peace with the idea of losing the company, starting over again, no money, no salary, no, no assets. So we'd have to come home probably, live at, you know, live at home and start, start all over and then rethink what I was going to do. I, th I knew I wanted to still be an entrepreneur. I mean, I thought about it a little while, like, oh, I'll probably go get a job somewhere. And then I didn't, that didn't last very long. Maybe a couple of days I thought about it. So I was trying to get comfortable with what does it mean for me to be a person, you know, who's, who's Derek? What, what is his goals and what does he want to do? And that's when I started to think, well, what's needed in the world and how does it match what I'm good at? Well, I'm good at creating things. I'm good at seeing where the future might be. Um, sometimes I get the timing wrong because, I mean, if I'd known it would take eight years for Hyper Factory to work, you know, I might not have started it. Um, and I think, you know, I understand how to be an entrepreneur, which is what's the opportunity, what's the problem, how do you create the roadmap, how do you resource it and get it going and inspire people to want to be a part of it. What I was looking for at that time was what are the problems I want to chase? Instead of, you know, a, a product, what are the problems in the world that I know nothing about? So at that point in, you know, my life, um, I'm ashamed to say I really didn't know anything about anything because I was, basically everything was on hold until I'd successfully achieved one company. So my relationships, spent the amount of time I spent with my family, um, and I had a big long list of things I would do after I'd sold my first company kind of thing, you know? But I've talked to lots of entrepreneurs that have done lots of companies and they never get to that list because they just start a new one straight away. And so I wanted to learn what the problems are in the world, you know? Things I didn't know anything about, climate change, poverty, challenges in, you know, uh, corrections and prisons and drugs, and understand how does entrepreneurship play a role? And in that last few years of having that journey, you know, I'm convinced that entrepreneurs will play a critical role. If they build new types of organizations that generate revenue models that also try to address social issues, and that big business um, is also responsible for using its engine of growth and inspiration and resources to similarly um, tackle you know, problems in the community. Um, what's holding us back from that, I think, is just a mind shift. You know, uh, business is a participant in society. It should participate productively across all aspects of society and not think of itself as a sole uh, owner of the outputs of its work or its profit. And I think that what's happening, I just came from a conference this morning called The, the Project, The Big Shift, which is about this, this shift. And it's just a zeitgeist shift in the world. What is the role of business? We have been told since Milton Friedman, it's to make money, to maximize shareholder profit, and everything else must be to the side. I think we're growing up as a, as a species to realize that that's wrong and that we're now moving into a new phase where business's role is to society as much as it is to shareholders and that new models will uh, emerge to enable that to happen. Okay. Yeah, it's quite a different. On that note, given I know we're going to run out of time, we'll take a couple of questions from the floor. Yes, sir. Has anyone got a qu any questions? Anyone want to put a question to Derek? Derek? Got time. No? So Derek, how do you find uh, the environment in New Zealand for entrepreneurs? I mean, do you find it different? I mean, you spend half your time here, half your time in New York. Is there anything unique about being here? Um, do you find the number eight wire thing really works? Are we really short of capital here? Uh, I think that in the 10 years that, um, uh, well, the 12 years since we started the first companies and now it's matured immensely. There's, there's capital to start a company. There's lots of networks. There's lots of people. And uh, I think if you had a good idea and you have a good team, you'll definitely get funded, you'll be able to do it, and you should be able to have as much success as anyone else in the world. So we've grown an ecosystem over the last 10 years that works. Mm. Um, and now you'll see examples of it with lots of different companies that are starting to go out there and try. Mm. And they won't all succeed, a lot of them will fail, but um, you know, to dream that we have a company like Zero and that people understand how it, you know, it's, it's trying to go about its goal mm. is far from where we were 10 years ago. But same side, same, same, same side of that equation, or other side of the equation is when you're in New York or in, your, you're in Silicon Valley, you're, you're surrounded by the people that created Facebook, WhatsApp, you know, SpaceX. Yeah. I mean, companies that are really trying to change the world in a massive way. So it makes you feel very small and very 
uh, you know, I guess humble. Like it's well, there's still a long way to go. Yeah. You know, we haven't created an iconic country, a uh, company out of New Zealand, yeah. um, but we will. And uh, you know, I think that it'll it'll happen sooner than sooner rather mm. than later. Okay. So, so Derek, you're Asian. How does that affect your viewpoint as an entrepreneur? And as you know, New Zealand has this rapidly growing very fast interface with Asia, and there's this super diversity here. We've got the CEO of Auckland Council here, one of the most diverse cities in the world. How does that have an impact on entrepreneurs here? How does that have an impact on you? <laughs> well, I kind of, you know, try to live in the world at large, like uh, not pocketing, you know, myself in different, pl in different particular spaces, but um, I think diversity in any context is good. I think, uh, you know, diversity of thought to produce uh, greater outcomes is always better than, you know, vanilla and um, less diversity. I think that uh, it'll enable New Zealand entrepreneurs to probably understand how to address solutions in Asia much better than we ever would have. Because I think at the moment, you know, when we think about tech entrepreneurs in New Zealand, they're really mostly looking west. They're looking to the US. They're not really looking north. So hopefully that is a huge opportunity um, especially as we were talking about, you know, what's going to change in those markets, particularly in technology. So having an increasing uh, base of people who understand those markets, uh, combined with our increasing capacity to create entrepreneurial companies, um, you know, we should hope to see new types of companies that are looking north to create solutions for those markets, and not just ones that are hoping to go straight to Silicon Valley, uh, you know, uh, the traditional route mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, technology. That's great. Can you think... Derek Handley and also Taryn Kunji. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.